So welcome to the fourth History Bites of 2021, the Memory Cycle Edition. My name is Dawn Owen and I am the curator at Guelph Museums. History Bites is a one hour long casual conversation during which we chat about the latest news, exhibitions and other happenings at the Guelph Civic Museum. Join us on Facebook Live on the third Wednesday of every month at noon. A recording of today's History Bites will be available through the Museum Everywhere portal on our website and on our social platforms after the live broadcast. Before I introduce and welcome our guests, I would like to focus our thoughts within an awareness and acknowledgement of the land. Guelph is situated on the ancestral homelands of the Anishinaabeg peoples, specifically the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Through the Between the Lakes Purchase Number no. 3 Treaty of 1792, the Mississaugas of the Credit ceded to the British Crown over 3 million acres of land between Lakes Huron, Ontario and Erie. Today, Guelph is home to many First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples, and Guelph Museums commits to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action and to doing more to learn, share and support truth and healing. When we started the History Bite series, we spent time in close conversation about the land, its history and its peoples. And we continue to build our knowledge and present day relationships. This commitment informs all that we do at the museum and includes today's conversation. And of course, today's conversation is inspired by an exhibition called Memory Cycle Resonified Artifacts, which is on view at the Guelph Civic Museum until September 5th. Memory Cycle is a collaboration with composer and sound artist Gordon Monahan. This exhibition is a foray into the parlor rooms of Victorian Guelph and an experiment with imagined Victorian era piano record recordings. Using furniture and keyboard instruments, from the museum's collection, as well as found domestic and farm equipment. Gordon experimented with period sound by transmitting vibrations through the artifacts. Gordon works with the principle that the human ear perceives uh, vibration as sound, and visitors to the exhibition will hear sounds that allude to those emitted by the instruments on display. In a process called sonification and resonification, the artifacts become sounding objects, transmitters of recorded sound, as well as sound sculptures. And the sound installation is in the midst of a Victorian era, era parlor room, offers a ghostly rendition of music that may have once vibrated through the displayed objects. Like memory, the circulation and recirculation of sound calls forth the music and history of times past. And for today's uh, program, I'm delighted to introduce my guests, of course, Gordon Monahan and also Jesse Stewart, both of whom are well known to Guelph. Um, we three have known each other for some years. Uh, we met uh, many years ago uh, through the McDonald Stewart Art Centre, now the Art Gallery of Guelph. Uh, when I was uh, sort of in the early 2000s, when I was uh, curator then, curator of contemporary art, and uh, actually Jesse and I go back a little earlier than that, in that we uh, did uh, shared a few courses during our undergraduate degrees at Guelph, and of course Jesse, you went on to do a number of other things, including your PhD at the university. And then uh, you both uh, were affiliated uh, for some time with the Guelph Jazz Festival. And of course, there was a big component of the festival every year that uh, that happened in the McDonald Stewart Arts Centre. And of course, um, in 2005, Jesse, you also curated Gordon's work, uh, a major installation at the McDonald Stewart Arts Centre um, here in Guelph uh, at the time. And so I had an immersion some years ago now um, and an experience with Gordon's practice. And, uh, and I'm delighted now to sort of fast forward to uh, 2021 to be talking with you both and to be have, you know, having just opened a new exhibition with Gordon this time at the Guelph Civic Museum. Uh, so I'd like to uh, share a little bit about both of you uh, before we get our conversation rolling. Uh, firstly, Gordon. Uh, Gordon Monahan's works for piano, loudspeakers, video, kinetic sculpture, and computer-controlled sound environments span genres from avant-garde uh, concert music to multimedia installation and sound art. 
As a composer and sound artist, he juxtaposes the quantitative and qualitative aspects of natural acoustical phenomena with elements of media technology, environment, architecture, popular culture, and live performance. He is the recipient of a 2013 Governor General's Award in Visual and Media Art. The renowned composer John Cage once said, quote, at the piano, Gordon Monaghan produces sounds we haven't heard before, end quote. I love that. I love that quotation. <laughs> I never tire of reading it, uh, Gordon. So welcome so much to the show, uh, to this program, and congratulations on the achievement of Memory Cycle. It has been a true pleasure to work with you on this project, and thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much. Great to be here. <laughs> And Jesse, Jesse Stewart is a Juno Award winning percussionist, composer, improviser, artist, instrument builder, educator, and writer. A dynamic and inventive performer, Jesse has a remarkable ability to coax music from virtually any resonating object or material. He has performed and or recorded with many internationally acclaimed musicians, including George Lewis, Hamid Drake, Roswell Rudd, Bill Dixon, William Parker, Evan Parker, Pauline Oliveros, and many others. In a 2002 review, Frank Rubellino described Jesse as one of the finest young per, uh, drummers and percussionists on the scene today. That's a pretty respectable quote as well. <laughs> Jesse Stewart is a professor also of music uh, at the uh, Carleton University in Ottawa. Thanks so much, Jesse, for joining us today. Oh, it's a it's a pleasure and very nice to see both of you again. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Lovely. So before we get rolling into that conversation, I'd like to share a short video of Memory Cycle so that listeners and viewers of this program can hear and see or virtually experience some of the exhibition. <laughs> So it's a, such a pleasure to be able to share some of the uh, Memory Cycle exhibition with our listeners and our viewers um, in this program. And Gordon, I'd like to take us back to kind of the beginning of this project. Um, so we started talking about it uh, in about February 2020, so pre-pandemic, if we can even imagine a time pre-pandemic. When we were working on another project and sort of scavenging, uh, scavenging behind the scenes in the museum for things like extension cords and other tech. Um, and Gordon, you had uh, sort of found your way into the storage rooms at the museum. And of course, uh, there were some things in there that caught your eye. And I think they formed the inspiration or the early inspiration anyway for what became Memory Cycle. Can you tell us a little bit about what that what you were thinking about in that sort of a sort of accidental moment when you were looking at uh at into the storage collections at the museum yeah um it 
I um, had gone upstairs. So at the museum, uh, one of the upper floors is a storage room. But you have some equipment up there and you have uh, a large part of your collection of artifacts. I think it was when I was setting up the actual um, symbol installation which was a completely separate piece uh, in 2019. Um, and I had gone up there with uh, Luke, who Luke Stempian, who's um, on the staff at the museum. And he had taken me up there to, we'd gone up to look at a couple of options, how we we're gonna hang some cables or something. And walked in and I immediately saw these, what I thought were square pianos. Uh, turned out they were square melodions, so organ-based instruments, but um, identical in visually to square pianos of a mid 19th century era, a day between 1840s to 1870s, prior to the invention of the upright piano, which came on the scene, manufacturing scene, um, in the uh, approximately 1870 period. So these smaller square pianos were, were more uh, common instruments at that time. And uh, I was familiar with the basics of the instruments. And so I immediately thought, well, you've got at least four of these. So it would be great to do a four channel piano installation using these instruments. Um, so uh, that was the beginning of the idea. And um, we discussed it uh preliminarily at that time and i suggested well i could uh apply for funding from the canada council and if we're successful we're going to be able to do this and it did work out that way although we didn't ante anticipate the pandemic covid pandemic which <laughs> which kind of delayed the de the final development of the project but we're able to work through whatever restrictions we had and um I just made fewer planned visits to Guelph on site, which was necessary because of all the lockdown restrictions. So I just adapted to that and did try to do most of the developmental work at home. So um, that was that's basically a brief uh, description of how it all started. I, I so appreciate, Gordon, that that you were so flexible and so interested in just sort of like riding the wave of what was coming. I know, uh, you know, obviously the pandemic has been um, hugely challenging for um, artists, especially artists that perform live most of the time, at least pre-pandemic, we're doing that work. And, it, and you know, a lot of what this exhibition represents or, or could have represented in the process was, you know, a frequency of meetings, a sort of um, interventionist approach in the collections at the museum. We were talking about a host of different things, right? Uh, we have because, um, you know, some of these pianos and organs in the Guelph Civic Museum's collection were made in Guelph. And uh, we were interested in sort of what would happen, for example, if we took um, one of those keyboard instruments that is, you know, on semi-permanent display in the museum, but but is there sort of as a finely crafted furniture object. And, um, you know, what happens if we were to do this, a sound intervention with, with an object like that, so that visitors to the museum who wouldn't expect necessarily to engage with it sonically might have had the opportunity to do so. Um, what evolved, of course, is the present project. Uh, we didn't do what I just described, but it was one of sort of the, the ways in which this project itself ebbed and flowed around the challenges of the pandemic. And in fact, where we landed was in, um, you know, a feature exhibition, which is very much uh, centralizes the experience. So uh, I think, you know, I'm delighted as curator in the museum to, to have been able to create a project with you uh, sort of against all odds in the context of, of, of the time period that it was developed through, uh, but that now lives as a, as a fully installed exhibition um, in the museum. Of course, we're closed at the moment because of the lockdown in Ontario. So, um, but we do hope to reopen as soon as uh, it's safe and protocols allow us to do so. Um, and of course, this exhibition will continue on for some months. So uh, I'll, I'll look forward to the time when we can actually welcome people into the space, but I think that gives us a good context for um, for what the exhibition is and how it came to be. 
you know, the sound installation or the sonic experience that is central to memory cycle is based on the principles, as I said at the beginning, of sonification and resonification. I will freely admit that these terms were new to me. Uh, when you first shared them with me, I had to sort of wrap my head around what that meant uh, by way of an exhibition installation in the museum. And as a hearing person, frankly, you know, it took me a while to understand that I perceive vibration as sound. And, and I sort of come to the place where I understand that all sound is vibration. Um, and as, you know, as both of you are experimentalists in sound, you, you both have a fundamental understanding of vibration technology. So, Jesse, I wondered if you could help us to really um, understand or to describe in your own words what sonification is. Uh, sure, yeah. Um, so uh, when I think of sonification, really, I think we're talking about expressing data of some sort through sound. Uh, so and normally like non not not uh, spoken sound. So it's like non textual sound. Uh, so we can visualize data in all kinds of different ways. But of course, we can also express data through sound in different ways as well. So I can give you a couple of examples. Um, uh, someone I know is doing some really interesting work in the Netherlands uh, around uh, sonification in hospital environments. And, and uh, as anybody who's spent time in a hospital know, knows, uh, hospitals can be pretty noisy environments with many different machines that, uh, you know, produce sounds of various kinds. It can be somewhat cacophonous. So she's doing interesting uh, work uh, trying to sonify data, like biometric data of patients, but in a way that is pleasing to, to the ears. So uh, to be easier on the patients and also the staff who work in hospital environments. So I thought that was quite an interesting project, an interesting example of sonification. So using sound to uh, express things like heart rate and you know, like pulse rate and, and uh, you know, other vital signs and so on, but to do it in a way that um, maybe sounds more pleasing than uh, the, the current situation where you have not a whole lot of consideration given to the interplay of all these different sounds in a hospital environment. Uh, and incidentally, that researcher's name is Elif, Elif Oskan. And then one other uh, project that, that I'm sort of peripherally involved in um, that speaks to this idea of sonification or expressing data through sound uh, it's actually a, a doctoral student at Carleton where, I, where I'm a professor and uh, she's uh, doing her uh, PhD under my supervision. A uh, very, very interesting project. Her name is Patricia Berube and uh, the, the project uh, that she's doing is uh, she's trying to find ways to uh, express color but non-visual ways of expressing color. So one of those is textures. She will create a representation of two-dimensional painting, but have different textures that um, basically kind of represent the different colors in the painting. But she's also working on trying to sonify the painting as well. So trying to come up with different sounds or different sonic textures for the different color patches and so on. That will hopefully be, uh, I think the idea is to that this might be of use to, to people who are blind or have low vision. So I thought that was kind of an interesting example of sonification as well. But really it boils, boils down to expressing data of one sort or another uh, through, uh, through sound. That's, that's what I think of when I think of sonification. Yeah, that's really helpful. And thanks so much for bringing forward some examples um, of, of sort of uh, work that is currently developing um, around these principles. And um, I, I think what I've learned through this process is that, um, you know, those those of us for whom sound or, or those of, those of us who take for granted sound in its sort of direct or, or unmediated forms, as if we can imagine it in that sense, um, uh, you know, and I'll use my, myself as the example, um, you know, it has taken me a while to really wrap my head around what this is, but in fact, based on the of the experience of this project with you, Gordon, and also with, with what you've just described, Jesse, I think actually we're much more acclimatized to sonification than we probably realize uh, as just sort of casual people uh, going about our worlds that may not sort of be as deeply invested in sonification processes as you both are. Um, Gordon, in the context of memory cycle, what is then resonification? 
Well, um, because of the basic de uh, definition of sonification that, that Jesse explained, uh, which is the process of taking data that, and then sonifying that data, creating sounds, or in some many cases, music from data uh, sources. Uh, we're doing a little bit of a different thing here. So I'm I'm taking up uh, a technique that was pioneered by David Tudor uh, in the 1960s. Uh, David Tudor is um, one of the very first contemporary um, musicians and composers and sound artists who uh, used electronics very early on. We're talking 1950s when electronic music instruments were not uh, commercially available. Um, and uh, in any case, in the 60s, Tudor developed a technique of using everyday objects as um, uh, sounding devices that could reproduce audio signals that would be sent into them through contact transducers or contact loudspeakers, you might say. Um, in some ways, it's a sort of deconstruction of the typical audio system from a very technical point of view. Uh, so uh, that's basically what's happening here in the, in the memory cycle installation is that uh, uh, each of these four keyboard instruments have contact transducers inside of them. They're come to the of the instrument so that when piano music is played into the um, contact uh, loudspeakers, um, it's approximating a, as if the, the, the instrument is played live in front of you. It's a simulation of an imagined uh, reality. Uh, at the same time, I'm going to just describe technically uh, what uh, to add on to this. So there are the four channels that are split between these four keyboard instruments. So in fact, when you're when you're sitting or standing in the middle of them, you're hearing the piano playing around you, surrounding you in a four, imagine four loudspeakers surrounding you. Instead of the loudspeakers, it's actually the keyboard instruments themselves behaving as loudspeakers, they're simulating loudspeakers. Prior to the sound arriving at those keyboards, however, in order for to introduce somewhat more um, experimental um, and perhaps um, poetic as, or in subjective interpretation of the whole thing was that I also wanted to incorporate the use of everyday household objects, such as bed frames, uh, bed springs, uh, there's a crib, so these crib from the collection in the, in the installation, uh, and as well as a couple of farm implements because uh, Guelph is an agricultural, traditionally an agricultural farming community. Um, and so what I'm doing is I'm actually transmitting the piano sound objects and then attaching contact microphones or contact pickups to those objects and recycling it back into the uh, computer that's transmitting all of the audio and then mixing it with the original piano sounds that then get sent out to the the four different uh, keyboard instruments that so what you actually hear if you get close to some of these furniture pieces is that you'll actually hear re them resonating with the piano sounds as well so it's actually a, an eight channel sound piece that is recycled through and ends up being predominantly a four channel uh, realization realization and product. Um, did I 
Thanks, Get Gordon. Off yeah, no, errors, no, not at all. No, I just didn't want to interrupt you because I was, uh, I was, you know, you and I have had um, a lot of conversations that that have flowed in this way, and uh, and I I never tire of sort of listening for the nuances and how you describe this work. And what I would say too, and one of the things that I'm really looking forward to once we get to open our doors again and welcome people back into the museum, in particular in the midst of this exhibition, is that. Um, the, uh, the the sound experience, I think, for people who are not maybe anticipating it in the way that they will experience it in this space, um, and and the sort of um, uh, di the difference in the relationship between you know the relationship to these keyboard instruments within the context of a civic heritage space when they're usually not performing or performed on, never performed on, um, is a really transformative experience, right? I, I remember even sort of with all of the the um, journey that we've been on and all of all of your patience and education of my knowledge so that I could really understand it and be able to support and to present this exhibition well, um, really didn't prepare me for the actual sonic experience in the midst of the space. It really is absolutely extraordinary and uh, I'll, I say that sort of not wearing my curator's hat but wearing my sort of just casual listener's hat because I would define myself in that way um, an appreciator of music but not what someone who sort of um, has the technical acumen or, or really understands how music is sound is controlled and music is composed that's not who I am as, as, a, as a listener and so what I really appreciate in this exhibition is uh, what all of that technical process that you've just described does is that it actually is a really atmospheric experience. Um, you're in the midst of the space. You can sense as you move towards some of the objects in the in the room that are sonified and then resonified. Um, is the sort of sound moving around the space. So it's a very spatial experience, whereas oftentimes we think about sound, at least the casual uh, engagers of sound, um, think about it as sort of a, a more singular or more specific experience. And I, I really love how sort of the whole fabric of the exhibition changes based on the sound installation that you've created. And I wonder if this is a, a good segue, uh, Jesse, into some of the work that you've been working on. Um, this is a piece, of course, that I've only experienced really through a recording on uh, YouTube, but it's your gong installation. And forgive me, I don't actually have the title of the piece, but I know that you recently debuted it at a virtual conference um, at the Institute of Critical Studies in Mexico. Um, can you share with us a little bit about that piece and also how it relates or is influenced by the by Gordon's work. Uh, sure, sure, yeah. So, um, <clears throat> uh, so over the course of the pandemic, so for the past year or something, uh, I've been making uh, a series of tuned gongs out of aluminum uh, di aluminum discs of uh, different diameters and thicknesses, and uh, so I have about four octaves in in uh, tuned uh, gong, so 48 or something like that, uh, so far anyways, and, and I've designed it to be kind of modular and, and fairly flexible in how it uh, can be set up. And uh, like, like every other musician, uh, you know, on earth about, um, uh, all, you know, I, I haven't played music with other people in, in over a year now. And, uh, so I've been kind of, um, you know, looking for ways to to play music, uh, you know, with others again, uh, and in particular in recent years, um, something I've I've been doing more and more of uh, is has been trying to make music in a in um, a, an accessible way in an inclusive way, and so this is this is involved, um, you know, collaborating, making music with people with uh, disabilities of various kinds. So if somebody has very limited mobility, for example, very limited motor control, how can we make music together? And uh, so I've I've been, you know, using a variety of technologies that translate movement into sound, essentially movement into music, you know. Uh, but of course, all of that stuff all of those collaborations um stopped with the pandemic i you know can't it's not like i can go into somebody else's house or into a hospital or whatever to make music so i've been trying to find a way to facilitate that work 
using these gongs online. And so I've been working on a, a website that will, hopefully it's not functional yet, but hopefully uh, it'll allow people to interact with them, uh, multiple people to interact with the gongs and with each other uh, online. That's the end goal. But in the meantime, as a kind of workaround until the website is functional, uh, I'm using uh, uh, some motion tracking software that um, basically will track, a, uh, if I'm on a Zoom call, it'll track movement on my computer screen and then tr uh, translate those movements into little electrical impulses, little MIDI signals that get sent to a series of mechanical strikers that I can hook up to the gongs. And so that way, even just over Zoom or something like this, uh, you know, people can, can control the gongs remotely and uh, I can in turn, you know, respond musically, you know, that kind of thing. So that's uh, that's what I've been working on. It's very much a work in progress. It doesn't really have a a, a, a name, uh, a title just yet, but it's uh, it's in the works. But as for the connection to Gordon's work, I mean, Gordon has been uh, making musical machines uh, as, and and MIDI controlled mechanical strikers that uh, attach to different percussion instruments, uh, found percussion instruments. Gordon's been doing that for a very very long time and in a very sophisticated way. Um, I think probably the the earliest um, uh, kind of installation slash performance of Gordon's along those lines that I saw was uh, uh, incredible. Um, a couple of performances at the music gallery in Toronto in the late 90s. I don't remember the exact year. This is when the music gallery was on Richmond uh, Richmond Road. And uh, I believe it's called Sounds in Space, I think, if I'm remembering correctly. And uh, it was incredible. He had all these, yeah, like I say, metal sheets and and and, and these instruments that were, uh, these objects that were turned into musical instruments and uh, little mechanical strikers and, and pulleys and all these things. And, and then he sat at a computer and kind of orchestrated them, these things that were all around enveloping. So that kind of spatial dimension that you were talking about uh, with this, this current piece, um, Memory Cycle, uh, that was certainly a, a spatial piece too. So I was, uh, I was uh, in my uh, early 20s, I guess, at that point, and I, I was blown away uh, by that installation. It remains one of my favorite um, concert experiences, uh, you know, more than 20 years later now. Um, so, uh, as I say, Gordon's been doing that for a very long time. So, at, yeah, I think at some, and I'm a, a huge fan of that piece and of Gordon's work in general. So certainly at some level, I think there's a connection to uh, to his work there. Thanks so much, Jesse. And I'm really struck um, not only by your uh, your sharing in the context of um, how you how you you know learned about Gordon and his work, uh, how that informed some of your earlier practice, how you're you're taking that and innovating with those technologies yourself, but you're but you're sharing in the context of collaboration and what that has meant to you um, sort of pre-pandemic, what it means to you today. Um, I mean, this project that we've been engaged in, Gordon and I um, at the museum. Uh, is also another kind of fascinating collaboration, um, one that I wasn't, when I, you know, stepped away from contemporary art and into civic heritage, I wasn't expecting that I would have opportunities maybe as soon as this one to work with um, someone like Gordon uh, on, on a project like this one. Um, it's absolutely been uh, such an incredible journey for me. Um, and I wanted to sort of, um, sort of speak to that a little bit in the context of of what the Guelph Civic Museum does and how this exhibition is sort of pushing at some of the boundaries of the work um, in this museum and, and if, I think in others as well. Um, so this project is an opportunity of course to re reposition uh, Guelph's uh, what I say is a well-trod 19th century colonial narrative in the context of a sound installation that uses technology with origins uh, mapping to the Victorian period. And, you know, as I mentioned, I'm interested in sort of pushing the boundaries of what that means and, and, and what those understandings potentially are in the context of social, cultural, and political histories that are nonetheless represented in the images and artifacts of early Guelph that are, you know, you know we have 40,000 plus um, images and artifacts in the Guelph Civic Museum's collection almost entirely representing its colonial heritage and uh, and of course that are on you know some of which are on display in memory cycle you know so how to do this work in the context of what i've just described and 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 in a way that is um 
that is supported and also um, challenged by a project like Memory Cycle. So Gordon, I'm wondering if you can um, share with us how your sound installation in the Civic Museum, I would say sort of echoes, reinvents, and also reimagines that sort of Victorian era music and parlor room conventions. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, well, um, I think it comes back again to um, just touching back on the sonification and resonification, so to speak, Ter terminology, uh, because uh, as uh, Jesse had done a, a few minutes ago, describing the process of data being converted into sound and music as sonification. So, as I had described, we're playing sounds back into these pieces of furniture and instruments. So, rather than sonification, it's actually a kind of resonification. That's where the re sonification term term comes in because it's not being data driven it's being imagining sounds that may have once occurred through these pieces of these objects and these artifacts and then trying to recreate that in a convincing way um so uh, again another part of that idea comes from the essence of how sound and vibration works so uh first of all sound and vibration and music are physically invisible to the eye so um that's an interesting aspect that we just take for granted we don't think about that too often but when you think about it there are these vibrations in the air that you don't see at all uh, but you do see objects around you and those objects that that are vibrating to reproduce and whether an object is producing or generating the actual sounds the objects in the vicinity and in the environment the sound space around those sounding objects those objects are also vibrating in also an invisible way and um ultimately only in a tactile way really but um they're again ignored and that whole process is also invisible to our normal conscious um, recognition of that process nonetheless it's a to understand that uh if the piano is being played beside a table, the table is actually receiving those vibrations as much as you are in your body and ear. And although it's not receiving being, it's a it's a passive object that is um, absorbing the vibrations. What happens to those vibrations? Well, they disappear, obviously, but they can be recreated by modern technology or different tricks that we can use we can reposition technology to cre to create the illusion that these things are actually resonating again and um part of so part of this sort of subjective sort of poetic idea is, is that um certainly the piano tones the individual notes that are being played in this installation did in fact resonate through these instruments and through these pieces of furniture in the past it's just sort of a fact if you play a c note on the piano that c note was played thousands tens of thousands hundreds of thousands of times over the lifetime of that instrument when it was being used in the home um, during the victorian era when these instruments were built and used and those that c note whether or not it was in a folk song or a classical piece of music or a popular piece of music, that note did vibrate in that instrument and it was transmitted into the bed frame or the, uh, the chair or the table or whatever is around in the so-called Victorian salon. So the salon was, a, was the Victorian era of the living room. Um, I don't believe the living room came into use until the, sometime in the 20th century. 
prior to calling rooms living rooms they were the salon they were kind of the reception area of the house if you were class or upper middle class you had a larger house and you had these salons and the salon would be where the piano would be or the organ and that would be where the music took place and as we all know um prior to the advent of audio recording technology music was not being played back from any devices it was being played live uh, by people children adults both of them combined in various groups uh, solo duets um, trios and so on all participating in um, the music that was taking place in the households of that era and um, as pianos uh, and these instruments became more easily manufactured it became cheaper and easier to acquire so you didn't necessarily have to be a wealthy person to to have a piano at home and um, more people learned to play the instrument and that was the formed the basics of um, of music experiences in the Victorian era and, and pre-Victorian era. So um, all of these uses of the salon um, atmosphere, the instruments, the various artifacts, these all play a role in reflecting the social uh, and um, household and is attempting to recreate that and the music also recreates it as well yeah absolutely i i um you know it's interesting this project has um sort of shifted a little bit my approach to a lot of this material that lives within the guelph civic museum's collection um you know this is the first time i as a curator have have sort of uh, aesthetically created an installation that is sort of born of this period and of course it was directly um, inspired by the work that you've produced Gordon so it's a sort of coming together of that uh, what you would sort of what you may expect to see in a um, a civic heritage space such as in a place called the city of Guelph um, but also you know it, it is a it is I think still interventionist in a lot of ways because the how the the sound or the music takes you or, or travels th literally through you but also sort of as an experience right we, we are transported I think initially in that space to Victorian era Guelph, um, not only by the dressing of the room, but also the sounds we're hearing. But those sounds shift and change, right? And we, we, we start to be able to perceive where they're coming from in the room and how they're composed, right? Not just in terms of, um, you know, it, you know, what we might understand to be a song or a, co a composed piece, but the how that sound becomes fabric or texture in the space, right? And I think right away we start to, as a visitor um, in the midst of the exhibition, we start to move away sort of a, from a conventional or traditional understanding of that Victorian era into someplace else. Um, maybe we collide a little bit with the present day. It's not as much time travel as it's sort of, um, we'd like to think these exhibitions can, can achieve. Uh, and I'm really interested in that sort of that journey making, right? Um, and I thought maybe uh, Jesse, you could um, help us to expand our understanding of, of some of those relationships. And I'm thinking, you know, it could be uh, in the context of gender, say, uh, for example, our class associations um, that are nonetheless imbued in this Victorian society and related or, or somehow shared or communicated in the organs, pianos and keyboard instruments uh, and the music that they made uh, popular in the period. Could you speak to that a little bit? Uh, sure. Yeah, I'll try. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think uh, you're both quite right that they're they're um, uh, these objects, these these instruments, pianos in particular, um, had a uh, kind of uh, class affiliation um, in uh, the you know latter half of the of the 19th century and into the 20th century. Right, owning a piano was a a, a symbol of social status. So so upper class and kind of upper middle class, and that that continued into the 20th century. So, for example, my grandmother 
um, wanted to have a piano uh, in the house. She didn't play piano. My grandfather didn't play piano. None of their kids played piano. Uh, and despite their pretty solidly working class roots, my grandfather uh, worked at a, at a, a, a factory that made uh, automobile windshields, uh, it was very important to her to have a piano in the house that no one ever played. And uh, and I think for her, part of it was as this kind of, yeah, it was a, a symbol of, of a certain kind of social status or social standing. Uh, now, in addition to its class associations, I would say that the history of the piano is also highly gendered. So in, in the Victorian era, young women of a certain social standing were expected to play the piano and sing. And so, in fact, the Royal Conservatory of Music actually began as a finishing school for young women. And so playing piano was like one part of uh, what was expected in domestic life for, for young women. So in the salon or in the parlor, uh, after dinner, it would be there was a kind of expectation that young women would uh, play piano and sing songs, and there developed a whole kind of repertoire called parlor songs, uh, you know, around this tradition. But typically, it was a lone female singer with piano accompaniment, and uh, actually, the that repertoire, the, that nineteenth, those nineteenth century songs, parlor songs. Um, were actually really important in uh, exerted a considerable influence, I would say, on the future direction of popular music. So a lot of the sorts of um, you know melodies, melodic compositions, but even even um, like musical structures, like song forms and so on. Uh, a lot of that uh, that we associate with. 20th century popular music, like beginning with like the Tin Pan Alley tradition and so on in the early part of the 20th century, the roots of a lot of that actually came from parlor song, this this uh, this tradition. But again, it, it there's there was a kind of uh, class um, a class association there, but certainly a gender a gendered uh, association as well. Thanks, Jesse, so much. And I saw you nodding, Gordon. I'm not sure if there was something that you wanted to add. Uh, as Jesse was describing. Yeah, there, there's um, all sorts of class connotations to the piano in the domestic scene. And it's true that it was a status symbol. And um, for instance, um, neither of my parents played musical instruments. Uh, although my, my, uh, my dad's mother, my grandmother played piano by ear. Um, so old Broadway show tunes by ear. Um, and on my mom's side, she came from French Canadian heritage and they all play music. Um, but uh, one of the things that happened was when we were young kids, they bought a piano and we were informed that uh, we would be taking piano lessons. And that, <laughs> that scared us you know, <laughs> because, um, they threatened to send us to the nuns and we had heard bad news about them using, you know, a yardstick to hit your fingers if you played a wrong note or whatever. Thankfully, we were, my parents found a, a great piano teacher in the neighborhood. And, and uh, But all of the kids in my family, there were five of us and every single one of us had to take piano lessons beginning at the age of about seven or eight. And there was no argument about that. We simply were sent to the piano lessons. And um, so um, that was, uh, um, you know, and, and, and when you keep in mind that my parents didn't play any music at all, there was a motivation there that, I don't know, to be honest, uh, why exactly beyond the idea that, that we wanted to have they wanted to have music in the house and that we would, I don't know, in the 60s, there still was not so much a, a recognition that music education was important uh, in terms of uh, potentially enhancing your um, academic education, which has since been proven to be the case. Uh, although I believe those studies would have come about uh, in the 70s and 80s, from my understanding anyway. Um, in any case, that's a personal anecdote of the piano and, and, and uh, 
You know, I think that there were so many pianos manufactured back in the heyday of piano making that, um, and there were hand-me-downs, you know, so someone would inherit a piano. So people came upon pianos and, and you know, a lot of, a lot of poor people learned to play the piano because they could uh, use it at the church basement or at the local community center and whatnot. Um, you know, so a lot of um, very important musicians who started out playing piano came from poor backgrounds, actually. Hmm. Um, yeah, it's so tradition. interesting. Yeah, I was going to say we, you yeah. know, we could we could do a deep dive um, in that direction. Um, that would be really out of my depth. I'm, I'm going to freely confess that uh, I did grow up in a household also with the youngest of five kids. Uh, we had a piano uh, center uh, of our living space, our living room, if you will. Yeah. Um, I I took about three months of piano lessons and and, it, and didn't take to it. Uh, I had two sisters who played both for 10 years. Um, but I just wanted to speak to a little bit of what you both referred to in the context of sort of like that general generational um, sort of um, adaptation of a convention that was sort of known and understood to be um, something that, you know, someone or a family who thought that they needed to establish themselves socially in a specific kind of way um, often would uh, you know, bring uh, piano or keyboard instruments into the home. So I should say too uh, that we also had um, an electric organ uh, in our home. Uh, I, I never yeah. attempted to play it, although I was fascinated by it I, in a kind of different way. Um, I'll say too, just from my perspective as a curator at the Guelph Civic Museum, and of course Guelph being the um, the site of the Bell Piano and Organ Company and, and the you know, the production for many, many years of both pianos and organs uh, in the history of Guelph. And of course, we hold a number of those instruments. Uh, you can attest to that, Gordon. It's part of, you know, the source of inspiration for this project in particular. Um, but it has also, it is really interesting because people uh, both in Guelph and outside of Guelph have inherited um, these instruments uh, from, you know, through their families. And oftentimes, and we see, we have seen a continuous um, volume of offers to the museum from individuals who have these instruments. Um, uh, most often, nobody uh, still living in the home uh, plays them. And they don't, you know, they have a reluctance to let them go or to just give them away or to, you know, uh, dispose of them. But the reality is, um, you know, our museums can only take so many of these instruments. I mean, we are always interested in knowing and understanding where these instruments are. Um, can we play a role in their preservation? Is this an, an instrument that should be brought into the museum? When do we say, um, you know, we're so grateful to know that you have this object, but we can't take it into the collection? These are questions um, that we have to entertain all the time in the, in the Civic Museum. Um, I don't want anyone to misunderstand that we don't want to know about these objects because we really desperately do want to know about them. Um, but, you know, they're also enormously large objects and they need to be cared for in a really um, responsible way. So, you know, we're, we're always in those dialogues and conversations with individuals who, you know, who do not play themselves and yet are holding on to these instruments um, in their family homes. Uh, and I think, you know, this brings me to my next um, point of discussion, which is really about the sort of quote unquote aura of the object. And in the context of a museum, you know, I, I can say sort of anecdotally that there is a sort of indefinable draw we have to artifacts, things that sort of in, invite, you know, come from another era, invite us into a little bit of time travel, if travel, if you will. And um, I think in the context of, of memory cycle, um, there is this other thing happening, which is sort of the, the um, what I call the specter of sound, right? There is this uh, other kind of amplification of that experience or the aura that these objects hold. And I wondered if, um, if Jesse, you could speak to sort of that hauntological aspect of memory cycle. Um, sure. Yeah, I'll try. Uh, yeah, this so this this term hauntology, hauntology, is a great term that I I think was coined by the French philosopher Jacques Derrida. He he wrote a wrote about Karl Marx actually um, a piece called Specters of Marx, and um, he talks about how Marxist that Karl Marx says how 
Marxist thought kind of uh, haunts uh, a lot of um, even, you know, contemporary thinking about uh, class and about uh, class conflict and, and uh, culture and so on. And so he coined this term hauntology, which is a combination of haunting, like as in ghosts or specters, and uh, ontology, like the study of, of being or the study of existence. And, um, and so this, uh, this, I think, is kind of an interesting term. And it's actually been applied to music um, and uh, specifically some, some uh, most, I would say most closely with some uh, people in Britain, uh, somebody who goes by the handle of the caretaker. Uh, who makes music that kind of repurposes much older music and, and uh, processes it in different ways. And so the music is about memory and nostalgia and, and actually the degradation of memory. Um, also another British, uh, British composer named Philip Jack. So a few, there's a few people who's, who've been associated with this idea of hauntological music. And uh, when you uh, first described um, this exhibition, uh, uh, Gordon's uh, exhibition, Memory, Memory Cycle, uh, to me, uh, I, it seemed like an apt kind of um, uh, description or an apt, uh, an interesting kind of concept to bring to bear on, on uh, this work. Uh, and then I, and that's even before I had, had seen the video or heard it. And then once I saw and heard it, I thought, wow, this, this seems, um, you know, if you'll pardon the pun, quite a resonant way of thinking about, uh, about this. Yeah. Uh, and, and I thought it was a, a appropriate, um, in part because of the, the, yeah, the way in which the piano haunts contemporary music and culture, right? Uh, but also because there is a kind of eeriness to the exhibition, right? These instruments with these sort of sounds coming from them, but they're not actually, no one's actually playing the piano, no, no one's playing the pump organ or whatever, and yet there there are these sounds. And um, and so the, the more I thought about it, I, the more I thought that this concept of hauntology you know, might be uh, usefully applied uh, to some of Gordon's other works too, because there's often a kind of eerie quality in some of his pieces that, let, that leaves us wondering, like, what is actually going on here? Like, how is this sa that sound coming out of that object? Um, and we see that in, in uh, several of Gordon's pieces, I think, of uh, uh, his uh, series of works called Music from Nowhere, where there are these uh, speakers, loudspeakers, and you hear sounds coming from them. But the backs are removed from the speakers. You go around back and you see that all the guts have been removed from these speaker cabinets. And he has a series of acoustic sound sculptures inside the speaker cabinets. So this, this, this again, this idea of like, what is actually going on here? Where's the sound? What, what's causing this sound? Um, so the, the way in which Gordon, uh, I think so, so the very interesting way in which Gordon kind of plays with expectations uh, and, and uh, in a challenging way, but also sometimes in a somewhat uh, eerie way too. Uh, I think of uh, some of his other works, uh, you know, including we, earlier we were talking about um, new and used furniture music, this uh, wonderful uh, performance that uh, Gordon did uh, in the early 2000s that um, I, I, I was happy to be in the audience for that one too. And again, there was this kind of, this this sense of the sort of ontological instability of like, what's actually happening here? How, how are these sounds being created? How is that sound coming out of that thing? Uh, but then also this sort of somewhat, um, yes, I don't know, this kind of, uh, this haunted aspect or somewhat eerie uh, aspect of some of his work as well. So I was, I was thinking a little bit about that, but it certainly seems appropriate for this, this particular, um, this particular uh, piece or installation. How does that sit with you, Gordon? Oh, well, it's great. Thanks for the compliments, Jess. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. A, a lot pleasure. of it has to do with, yeah, just this, um, aesthetic of um, creating, attempting at least to create some kind of illusion. Yeah. Um, and uh, thankfully, technology helps. Uh, there's a lot of tricks that you can do to make something seem like something that it is not, or something that is unexpected um, might be introduced to create this a sense of illusion or 
questioning or unexpected. Oh, that's uh, that's not how that would normally sound, you know. Um, it's uh, I don't want to get into a long-winded <laughs> historical discussion, but it it, it partly derives from the um, what you call in, in contemporary music performing extended technique um which is to produce sounds of uh, using a traditional musical instrument produce sounds on that instrument that are unexpected in themselves so um this is a well-known uh term to use to describe that uh, process that has come about primarily uh from the mid to late 20th century oftentimes having to do both with classical contemporary uh, orchestral music as well as uh, improvised music, um, free improvised music deriving from uh, traditional jazz, uh, postmodern jazz, let's say, to quote a Derrida uh, <laughs> phrase. Um, I didn't mean to interrupt so, you, Gordon, but okay. I, 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 um... I'm aware that we're sort of at the end of our time together in the, inside this program, and as usually happens with History Bites, um, is that we just get to the thick of it, uh, and then the program uh, naturally sort of comes to its close, but uh, I'll look forward to continuing these discussions uh, with you in a host of ways. Um, over the long lens of time. Uh, I will say though that uh, where, where we've left the conversation is an interesting uh, place for our listeners and, and soon to be visitors whenever we can safely reopen again, uh, for them to kind of come into this space, into memory cycle and, and, and experience it themselves. Because I think we can, you know, you've both done um, a really phenomenal job of sort of explaining not only the technological process, but also what happens sort of in the midst of the space and or a space like this. And I think uh, nonetheless, um, you really have to experience it to understand it. And I think that that's the thing about live performance also, that's the thing about sort of that, that continuous draw into these spaces where we really, uh, where we sort of submit uh, to the experience, but don't have to answer maybe all the questions of why we might have them or how it works, that kind of thing. Um, and I think that, uh, that that this exhibition really does that. It, it is, um, there are some aspects of it that I think uh, those uh, visitors who, um, you know, find themselves in civic museum spaces uh, often will uh, be familiar with, but then there are some prizes, so, excuse me, some surprises in the context of this particular show. Um, and I think on the flip side, those that might have sort of an in instinct to understand sonification and resonification and what you both have described um, as happening in this space and might um, come to new and surprising experiences and understandings of how that tethers into a civic heritage narrative. Um, so this ex exhibition really strives to achieve um, both of those end goals and, and then some. So um, may I take this opportunity to thank you both for spending some time with us, uh, sharing both your own thoughts and ideas and and the projects you're working on but also um you know taking the time to really uh you know center your thoughts within uh memory cycle resonified uh artifacts uh the exhibition as we've mentioned is up right now unfortunately the guelph civic, civic museum is closed uh due to the pandemic um we hope that we will be able to reopen again safely um before too long and i certainly encourage anyone listening uh, or watching to follow uh, the Guelph Civic Museum or Guelph Museums and all of our social media platforms. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram are the best places where you can sort of stay connected in, not only check out online programs, but also for news of when we would reopen again. I definitely encourage you to take in Memory Cycle as soon as you can. Um, you can join us here again on History Bites, which broadcasts live on uh, Facebook uh, every, uh, the third Wednesday of every month. The next Next History Bites will take place on Wednesday, May 19th um, at noon, and uh, we'll be focusing on a project called Rapid Response Collecting. Um, until then, be well and stay safe. <laughs>